Lecture out the Bloomer residents and the board. Rich Wu, uh, member of the board, DLA Families, uh, resident owner. Please hop in with ADG and member of the board. Terry Rubenwright, DCLA resident, on the board. Dan Henry, with the Operating General, member of the board. Uh, Patrick Decker, Chief Operating Officer for the California. Hi, it's Steve Scherger with the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office. I'm the neighborhood prosecutor for the Los Angeles Hi, I'm Jimmy Del Chuck, working with Tombstock Properties in this angle. Dave Gordon, landowner and developer. Call Calvary, Sierra and Cassidy. Good morning, Laura Lang, owner and resident at Luma and board of representative for the HOA. Google with the Mary Operations Manager for Top Perfect. Uh, Ann Williams, I do land use entitlements at Somas. Roberto Rowdy, RP Bank, Nani Associates. Ethan um, Van Lurie Associates. Cameron Bain, she's a large investment. Greg Sandel, uh, resident at the Grand Office in Wilshire, the Union. And Linda LaFontaine, I'm Michael Holt, I'm Executive Director of Naval and Control Space located in the Bay. Wallace Lock, South Park Bay, Director of Communications and Policy. Josh Krieger, Director of Real Estate and Planning, South Park Bay. Danielle Vasili, Walk by Walk. Derek Hughes, Walk by Walk. Greg Scott, uh, resident owner at Evo and Thomas Realtor. Victor Gonzalez, all present, Paul and Carlos. Nelly for the door, she's evident to keep it up. Victor Gonzalez, all present, supervisor for South Park. Jamal Johnson, operations manager with South Park. Howard Rubenroy, resident of South Park and Florida County. Do it, the gentleman in the plaid shirt, did, I don't know if they got your name. That's my husband. That's your husband? That's my husband. Howard Rubin right there. No, no, the gentleman right there. Sorry, I think it's, oh, sorry. What was it? <laughs> no, right there. We don't have to get introductions if you want. Oh, we don't have to? Nope, just an invitation to introduce yourself if you so desire. All right, let's move right along. Um, actually, our first order of business here, are there any public comments?
Um, and so he appointed me to be a point person uh, in our office on both our civil and our criminal side of all the phones. So um, <clears throat> we've been trying to work you know, with all of our clients who are <coughs> agencies, as well as on our criminal side <coughs> sorry, to come up with a strategy about homelessness. Um, as you know, the city is doing um, permanent support housing as the kind of future, this is what we're going to do, uh, plan. You may know there's an RFP that's out for some more creative uh, building, and I think <coughs> financing has come out. Um, you guys take a look at that. In the meantime, there's still that crisis, so our office worked with the mayor's office. I'm using um, a state building code um, adjustment during this time period so that we can build more temporary shelters, and that's the Bridge Home and Bath Program. Uh, there's the first shelter that opens in El Pueblo. Uh, the second one is going to be the shelter in Hollywood, that's 100 beds. And then uh, Imperial, I believe, is the next one that's coming in line. There are proposed, they're still looking at them, they're still living the CEQA on a few here, one on Paloma in C14, and then one on Hope in C9. Um, again, they're not done deals. Feel free to put your input into your council members. They go through an evaluation process where they look at the land, they um, do all kinds of studies and things like that, and they take a lot of community input on that. Um, so that is the sort of temporary to the more permanent uh, semi-permanent solution. But even in top of that, our office feels like it is it's still so bad outside and it's, it takes a long time sometimes to build the shelters and they're quite expensive. So then in the meantime of that, our office has been working trying to coordinate better cleanups, um, the use of more bathrooms um, around needle pickup locations and with the needle exchanges and trying to get more trash collection out there as well. Um, as you know, sanitation is out there. There are good instructor resources. They have a hard time keeping people who uh, are consistently there to see really that job. When they come on a find encampment, they really are quite conservative, which we can do so many times. It's no wonder it's saying what's an encampment, what's someone's personal property, and what is trash. So I think there is a movement with some of the groups that work with um, the people to bring in homelessness to get them to create a pile of trash or get more trash cans out there for them to separate that themselves and get the to get it easier. But there are, you know, as you know, thousands of people on the street there are a bathroom for them and there's not any storage except for the bin that was built actually by our office because of litigation. So more storage is necessary to help on the streets. Um, and, and, and I think for the temporary theme, more bathrooms and so we're really trying to work on that in our office. We also have a page on our website um, on homelessness that has frequently answered, asked questions with answers, a summary of all the litigation that's around homelessness, Mitchell, LaVaughn, the new Boise case on Idaho, um, different things like that, and then also links to, if you just want to report the encampment, Lawson has created in the last two or three months a website called LA Hot, where um, you can report it on the website, they're supposed to send out a team of outreach workers within a few days. So that is something they're doing. We also have the people concerned, which is the spot leader, who are really great. So, uh, but I would like to take questions if you guys have any, because I know that sometimes there's so many things going on with homelessness. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Pat Barrett, and I reside in um, South Park. My main concern is, number one, is Mitchell versus the city of LA. Number two is because of the problems that we have with homelessness, number one is we have a, here in Southern California, we have the largest people, we have the largest encampment of homelessness in the country. Number two is we have the least amount of laws and we have the least amount of regulation. So what's happening right now is, and this is not just me talking, but I have sat down and talked to the police I have talked to residences that have been robbed. We have had murders because of it, and we really need to be concerned about this. Number one is Mitchell versus the city of LA. We need to go to court because of that. Number two is because of our lawlessness that we have in Southern California, and this is a fact, we have criminals coming in from Texas. They have a choice of being um, going to jail if they're caught, or one-way ticket to Los Angeles. And this was told to me by the cops. It was also told to me by somebody in Holmby Hills 
that got robbed. We had two people that got robbed and the owner caught them. So what are we gonna do, number one, to eliminate that? Number two is I am for bridge housing and anything that we can do. The other thing is we have a huge problem that was in Skidbrook one day doing a, um, <coughs> a tabletop. The drugs that are there and allowed is irreconcilable. You have a guy coming up, this is what I saw, in a big SUV van, going back and forth with somebody there exchanging drugs and lots of money. You have, a pros you have a prostitute on San Julian in Section 8 housing in the doorway going, hello, can I prostitute you? Sorry, I was, I, but I, anyway. I appreciate the comment. I want to get to other questions. So okay, but what I'm saying is, what are we going to do to prevent this? Okay, so a lot of these questions are great questions for County Council, which I'll say when he checks to see if it's coming any minute, because a lot of those are enforcement issues. Uh, um, Mitchell versus the City of Los Angeles, that's in litigation. I believe it's going to close session. Um, you know, if you guys get the agenda, you'll see it for City Council. Um, there was time for public comment in the Municipal Property Committee. Um, I would invite you all to read the opinion by the judge and the, uh, what we asked for a motion to reconsider, the opinion from that, and that will tell you where the bench stands on the city of Los Angeles. They don't appreciate that we haven't built a lot of shelter or storage or um, affordable housing or low low income housing. So we start from in litigation from a losing position because what we do is a lot of times we do actually a lot of enforcement compared to other cities. So um, I think that if you read that, you would see the judge that we have in that case. <coughs> and I'm not saying that we're not doing a good job yeah. because it's a huge thing, but anyway, that's stupid. Yeah, no, I, I so don't we're going to go to Lee and then Howard, we'll, we'll get your question. So it, it sounds like it's, a, it's an issue of, it's an elongated, cumbersome process to in order to get the, the bridge shelter built, one. Two, it's the same process to get storage units out on the streets and restrooms out on the street. What are you doing to expedite those things? Because those seem to be the biggest obstacles as it relates to getting everything done. Because I'm assuming that based on some of the propositions that are passed, there is money available, but it seems like you're caught up in these processes and I don't hear or see anything that is being done to expedite those. So the um, bridge shelter homes have a process that's run by the mayor's office and the CEO's office. I think they're going as fast as they can on that. The issue that I see that can happen is exciting because so many of the neighborhood groups go up in arms when a site is fixed. As you can tell from events, as we discussed it. Um, I live in that. Okay, so, so 100, uh, Sunset Boulevard. So that there's a lawsuit there now. So that would, you know, slow that down. <laughs> but you say that, that they're going as fast as they can. This is a huge issue. What does that mean? They're going as fast as they can. They meet once a week. They, they meet, meet once a once month. A week. They, they, they do because these are big issues, and right. it seems like there's a lot of inactivity. The mayor has made this the number one priority for every general manager. So at that meeting, that's once a week. They go over every single aspect of all of the projects in a bridge home, and then any other projects that aren't PSH related, which are on a different track through a different committee. The navigation center. Um, these, any storage, which has not really been a popular thing for council members to go forward, maybe because the neighbors don't want that necessarily in their neighborhood. There was one in Westminster that, that got parked by the end of that and didn't open. Um, so I think that that's a concern. They want the residents to feel part of the solution. Um, the money is there. They're using the state fee money, and they're using the state fee money for the bathrooms and rolling those out. So either purchasing them or leasing them would be cheaper and then try to roll them out in the budget for next year. Okay, we're gonna do one last question for you today, Howard. Hi, um, my name is Howard Rubenwright. I'm a lawyer. I have read the opinions. I was at the meeting where these matters were taken up, where it was almost unanimous that Mitchell should not be settled. And I know you went into executive session I hear that you reported it out to the city council without a recommendation. I don't understand that, and I'd like to understand that. But to me, there is no reasoned or humane basis 
for having people out on the streets. It's not good for the people on the streets, certainly not good for the residents or the businesses. The lawsuits are winnable. In the past, they've been resolved on grounds which I frankly don't understand as a litigator. If the city attorney's office doesn't have the resolve or feel it has the skill <coughs> to litigate these matters, then the recourse is to hire uh, or have volunteers or perhaps allow us to intervene in order to fight a fight that must be fought We've, we've changed the dynamic. We have the money. We're, we're moving on programs. That's what the federal court wants to see. And a case can be presented. But all I hear is a reluctance of the city attorney to fight this matter. And if you could explain why the committee, after hearing all of the testimony and studying the problem that you say you have, reported it out without a uh, recommendation. I'd like to hear that. Okay, so as you know, in all in litigations, both the lawyer, you would know that it's all confidential, and even the recommendation of how it went to counsel is confidential. The discussions they have are confidential. As you know, you know, there are clients. I can't reveal any of that. I can tell you, if you did read that judge's opinion, you know that the case, nothing in Mitchell stops anyone from housing the people on the street, from cleaning on the street, from removing any hazardous material on the street or contraband. Nothing in Mitchell stops them. I know. No. I know so that. that has nothing to actually do with Mitchell. Mitchell settles. <laughs> that will stay that way unless something is changed. In the entire city, right? So this is not just a bad skid row problem, but it's all over the city. Skid row tour. The more so you really, retreat and not fight these things, well, as the more... Well, as a lawyer now, you don't always fight things. Every single time, you just fight them. But I can't talk about that because it's a confidential, it's in settled. Well, Hopefully, after it's settled soon, then we can... I can tell you that 100% of the goal, the shots on goal that aren't taken are not going to result in, in a victory. So I'd like to see the city attorney fight it, or if not, have the council appoint the council who will. I have a, a solution or a problem. Um, with the amicus briefs or intervening or other things, right? There's a lot of horsepower in the city of LA. There's a lot of firms that I think, whether they're in the development world or represent these types of institutions or otherwise, and there'll be, I think, political support ultimately for helping the fight, right? I understand what, uh, about what you can and you can't disclose. Is there a way that like an organization like the South Park Bid or the Central City Association can help the city attorney's office of the city itself in bringing some of that horsepower to 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 yeah, help I, I, I can ask the litigation attorney. I don't. I, I you know it's all a strategy. I'm not sure that would be helpful. So, but the litigation attorney would be happy to speak to you. So, if you can just send me whatever information I can send you about it, that, and he'll talk about what he can. It kind of helps turn the ship, right? It's 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 a, a complicated problem, but. I think there's a lot of resources that can help I just would encourage you to read the Mitchell um, decisions by the judge and two of them. And I can share okay. that with Mr. Pop. Can I'm I ask sorry, a real quick I question? I came here specifically to ask one question. Yeah. Uh, one question. One question. Sure. Last question. Okay. You know, lots of questions. We hear from the police that they're not allowed to enforce. And then we hear from you guys at City Hall well, that you. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let, 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 let me talk. Let me talk. Please. We hear finger pointing. The police say, we are not allowed to do something, and you guys say, we are enforcing. Which is it? So it's a great question, right. and I'm not sure that Ida is actually the correct person to answer it, but we do have Matthew Harrelson, who is going to be coming in and sharing it. He's a new area captain for downtown LA. We're super excited to have him come and share his comments, and I think that that question is actually better directed to him. So stick with that, and I'm, I'm sorry that we're going to have to move yeah. on. Ida, thank you. I just want to introduce to you really quickly. Yes. Uh, which of you neighbor talks to because I've heard connect before and this is Tia. Sorry, I'm going to take one minute to grab <laughs> my, my timeline. Uh, my name is Tia Strozier. I'm on the criminal side. So when LAPD is enforcing these codes, they bring those cases to me if they involve quality of life issues, if they involve residents, businesses. We're already connected with South Park Bid to identify what those primary issues are so we can concentrate, LAPD can concentrate their resources, I can concentrate my resources on the criminal side. 
um, I'll come back to do a more extended uh, presentation. I just want everyone to know that I did bring my LA 311 report um, cards, resources, if you see encampments, if you see um, trash in the street, if you see bulky items, if there's concern, um, this provides information for how to report that. Um, also on the rear side, it provides the contact information for LAPD. Ironically enough, the city attorney's uh, email is, uh, website is not on here, uh, but that information is available. I can provide it to Ellen if you'd like that as well. They're available on the back table for you to take, and I will see you maybe next month. Great. Right. Thanks for being here. Sure. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, all right, so I'm going to move us along here in our agenda. Um, I know that there are a lot of follow up questions uh, from this group to the city attorney's office. Um, Please know that the bid is in constant communication with them, and I am happy to act as a liaison uh, going forward. So that line of communication is not over just because we have to move on on the agenda. So we will hear that. Moving on to item number six, we're happy to invite um, Daniel Tavon, who is also our VP, uh, just in time, right, and Hannah Blackman, to present on two projects. One is happening in South Park, and one is Right on the bound, uh, on the border. So, we're starting with South Park Drive? Yeah. Great. Right. Should we do that? Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Daniel Long with Street Enterprises, Hannah Bible, Paul Gagan. This is with. Um, so you can like, oh, okay. Perfect. 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 Yeah. Uh, I'm Dan Swan Enterprises. We are, for those of you who don't know us, we are privately held real estate investment development and management company based in downtown Los Angeles. Some of our recent projects include the Onyx project, which we recently completed down the street on People and Hope. We also recently developed the Topath projects on 6th and Main Street. We have a few other projects in the submarket that we look forward to bringing to the community, such as our Emerald project on 14th and Olive, as well as uh, our Main Street Park project on 11th and Main. Uh, in terms of general, park. We're very excited to propose our South Park Tower project, which is the two towers on Venice Flower on Hope Street, kind of on the southern end of South Park. It will consist of two towers. The West Tower will be 300 key dual branded hotel. Well, the East Tower will be 250 uh, market uh, apartment units. The two towers here will also have 13,120 square feet of commercial space with car parking on our This is a very blurry project information. I'm giving you the same thing. I'm answer for you. Um, Kind of the general part of the city. Again, our office is where we are, probably two blocks or three blocks north of here. Um, and we really like our location because we have that visibility from the 10 freeway, kind of right on the southern edge of, of our neighborhood. But also, it provides us some site challenges. Being a denser freeway is restricting. We also have the expo line to the west, so we have no vehicle access to the west side. Also, Hope Street to the east and the dead end street to the south which means Venice has their only two-way main access point, which itself, taking Venice in, actually, to get in today, is a very tricky street, there's a very, very dog there at that intersection. Uh, I like to joke that for 10 years, I've been complaining about that particular intersection, making that last turn from Venice on to Hope. Ironically, I now have an opportunity to try to correct that, and I realize it's really much harder than it was. <laughs> <laughs> this is a rendering of the project looking south, so if the orientation is off, I apologize. What you're seeing to the right is that hotel tower, and what you're seeing to the left is a residential tower. There's a lot going on, so I'm going to try to be quick so I know we're going to press for time. Uh, we have ground floor retail here. We have two levels of parking for the hotel tower. The second level of parking is going to be 15 foot floor to floor. That's going to allow us to convert that to commercial uses in the future if there's less of a demand for parking. We have a uh, amenity deck here where we're going to have meeting rooms, uh, pool, and outdoor event space here facing north to downtown. Then the hotel is going to go up. It's going to be dual branded. So it's kind of going to come out of the, the lobby to the left is one hotel, excuse me, to the right is another hotel. 
on the residential tower, you have 10,000 square feet of ground floor we have here, three levels of parking, it's our amenity deck in the north courtyard facing you to the downtown, and also our residential tower that can go all the way up. We have a pool on the rooftop um, for this project. A big part of this was looking at how do we combat the, the noise and the pollution that comes from the freeway, but yet still taking advantage of the views of downtown and the sun and the sunshade analysis. And as a result, we kind of put our towers in this configuration to maximize that. This is a rendering of the project in the north now from the 10 freeway. Uh, you see here we're proposing to put digital signage similar to what you see at Ultra Grand, Metropolis, and I live, and one people this as well. We want to be consistent with that approach to kind of create that project identification as you enter downtown. There's a lot of representation right now on the 110. But when you drive the 10, there's really nothing that interesting or that attractive. And so we feel our project gives us an opportunity to kind of create a visible interest at the very, uh, right at that moment we enter downtown line. <laughs> this is the site plan. Again, you have the expo line to the west, you have the freeway to the south, the dead end street here. So as a result, trying to kind of work vehicular access as well as pedestrian access. What we decided to do is try to pull all of our cars all the way to the bottom of the site where we don't presume we have any pedestrian. As a result, the rest of the project is completely uh, pedestrian and driveway free. Uh, one thing we want to do is put this kind of this paseo between the two towers to kind of create that entrance. And our entrance is both the hotel and the residential. It's towards the back of that. So we could have kind of naturally pull people into that paseo and get used out of it. We also have a curb bump out, a curb, I'm sorry, curb <coughs> recess we're proposing. Right on Venice, you know, with a hotel building, with the Venice Boulevard address, Uber, taxi, Lyft, they're not really going to know that they have to go to go back around. So we felt that rather than having to stop in the middle of the street, we would take that opportunity to pull back the curb a little bit and create a drop off point for our, uh, for our guests. That's both safe and we hope we'll get used a lot. Uh, we also are putting a curb bump out on the corner of Venice and Flower to kind of create more of a safety experience. You know, that train goes really fast, it's kind of dangerous right there on, on Flower Street. And as a result, we felt it was appropriate working with the city to try to enhance that pedestrian experience, not just from a safety perspective, also from an aesthetic perspective. Uh, that was a typical parking floor. I don't know, I'm here. This is a typical parking floor. This is our uh, fifth floor plan, so we the hotel tower to the west. You see where the many decks, meeting rooms, to the east, you see we have some many spaces in it. Roughly about a nine, ten thousand square feet of a uh, podium terrace that have three views of downtown. These are your typical floor plans. This is your, so one thing we did, is, and you can see better on the, on the rendering, but we decided to create these cuts along the ninth and tenth floor, create some more interest to the project on that south side. And there's going to be these outdoor amenity spaces about 90 feet up from the freeway that we feel to be kind of an interesting amenity deck that's different than everything else we're proposing. <coughs> and it's just your rooftop plan. Uh, we have a few mm -hmm. pent-up units on the east tower along the pool and another roof terrace. These are the elevations of the building. This section. This is the ground for landscape plan. So again, you see the bump out there on the corner of the side. We have the driveway drop off, or our, uh, driver drop off there on, on the middle of Venice Boulevard. Again, the most of the maximum come down here. This <coughs> landscape decks, <laughs> rooftop. This is my plan here. It's, um, and Black and Caucasian Public Affairs, working with Jade and Lafon. Um, this is a little bit of a heavy lift on some of the impediments that were requested, just because um, some of the items, the, the transfer floor area, we're requesting more than 15,000 square feet, so we have to go to the City Planning Commission. Um, City Planning Commission would also have to weigh in on the signage um, that we're proposing. Other than that, it's fairly standard. It's a, a track map for the subdivision of the property throughout the project. Um, a variance has been 51% of the required parking stalls to be designed as compact stalls. I think the code requires allows up to 40% of them to be, so we're asking for a little bit um, more to kind of fit our parking in appropriately, not to go up another level or anything like that. 
Um, it is a hotel, so we are going to have alcohol. Um, basically, put in the building and you know, like the little mini bars in the rooms and stuff like that. You have to get approval from all of that. Um, site plan review is required for any project that has more than 50 units or is proposing um, more than 50,000 square feet of parking. It just sort of allows planning to impose the downtown design guidelines, basically. Um, and then director determination to allow an increase in all planning areas, interior, open space. Um, the, the point there is, you know, the first slide, the early slide that Daniel showed that had all of those numbers on there. The one point that I made on there is that we're not requesting any reductions in open space, any reductions in, you know, on-site trees or anything. Some of these things are hard to fit in vertical towers. We're very proud that we've been able to design it and all of that. But um, we are asking for 27% of interior space instead of 25% to be able to count towards that open space requirement. Partly, I think that has maybe to do with the nice intentional cutouts or some of the other little unique areas that we're using in the space in the building. Um, that's it. We, on kind of the outreach, we you know, are asking for a letter of support. We'd love to see the support for a bit. Um, we last week presented to the Downtown Neighborhood Council, their planning committee, um, unanimously supported this project and the one next. Um, we're going in front of their full board next month, um, which should be you know, cool. <laughs> that's the, the recommendation from the committee. And we also have approval from like, Central City Association and our you know, reaching out to neighbors. The one last thing I'd add, because um, Ellen asked me when we were presenting the CCA the other week, and you can see here um, the way that we butt up right next to the freeway. Um, I did reach out to Caltrans to try to see how long the current lessee that is parking there, how long life is on their lease. Um, I think it's three years, we've been up there for two or three years, but um, we sort of asked that, uh, hey, well, let us know when there's an opportunity there. I'm still a little bit unclear if they have an automatic right to kind of renew or what the process is there. But um, we are inquiring and would love to help and kind of make something more than kind of the freeway there than just parking. Okay, so we, uh, as a policy business, we're going to serve as Are there any affordable units? No. What's your uh, screening for the podium? Um, it is screened and it's also the national. Is it going to be nice? <laughs> um, <laughs> go back to the rendering. <laughs> well, I can't help you. I mean, it's going to be there. One thing you didn't dwell on in this presentation is the, some of the movement we're seeing visually with the material. <laughs> So on, on this time, this time we come all the way down to be grounded in place here, and then here you have the screen that's occurring on the parking garage. One uh, thing I challenge my architecture team to do is try to create a little bit more of an interest in texture along with, on, the, on the window wall and the curtain wall. It doesn't come up great, but you kind of see how it's kind of more transparent to the top than it is at the bottom. You kind of see it there on the on the left side as well on the residential tower. The intent for there to be this movement uh, between opening and solid panels, as the tower goes up, it's very organic. It doesn't have a, a reason to it the way a lot of these other towers right now are very similar from the second floor over to the rooftop. And so that's another reason it can be a very unique approach to how we're designing our system. It doesn't come up great in these, in these renderings, but that is that. That's that. Well, the base is the most important part of the building because that's where people sit they're walking by. Okay. So that's where the building makes its statement. So the base. Well, I disagree with that. I mean, the entire building makes different statements, both from a pedestrian experience on the right of 50 feet, you're looking at what is within 15 feet. That's where your enhanced sidewalks are important. That's where your tree wells are important. That's where your blazing system is important. From, as you walk up to a building, you see the parking and enjoy it across the street, and then driving along the freeway or driving down Flower or Hope Street, and the entire tower. Yeah, driving down the freeway, you got what, two seconds? <laughs> no, no, no. What's the estimated area on breaking ground and then completion date as well? 
Um, we are still working through the city process. We're drafting our two analysis right now. The city likes to take their time, and the process takes a lot of time. So I can't speak specifically to when we're going to get our impoundments, you know, plans and permits that typically take 12 to 18 months when the construction falls. Yes, question. Yes, every developer says that the parking screens look great, and even on the illustrations, they may look great, but they end up looking like crap, excuse me. And it is destroying our quality of life in South Park to see these ugly parking structures raising three, four, five, six floors above the street level. In the past, they've been able to do them underground or at least put some kind of residence or retail <coughs> street facing. I will personally not be in favor of any new development that has a parking screen on the street. Walk by 1050 or Avon and see what they look like at night. <coughs> there might as well be no screen at all. So, I don't like having any screens on the street. Okay, thank you. Sure, one more question. Are you going to have doggy oh, cars? Sorry, I'm going to ask you that. I'm going to I have two questions. Um, what are the screens? Like, are they LEDs? Are they LCD? And what kind of content will display on them? And then also, what is currently in this space, in this area? It's currently a mix of industrial buildings. Okay. And parking, without parking. And then when you say screens, you mean the parking screen, you mean the digital signage. I guess both, just like what will be sort of displayed. Well, this is what you're going to see for the parking. And then as far as the LED screen goes, we haven't made that decision yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, sure, Casey, yeah. So a couple, uh, a couple of things. First of all, I think the tower, we'll both towers look great. The variation in the security side, the side of the thing. But the uh, extra activation is going to be strong. You can spend 10,000 feet of the ground for retail. Uh, <laughs> and so you also mentioned the second floor of the parking might be convertible uh, if the parking requirements drop. Would this screen be done in place impact that, or have we thought through how we Well, we're trying to design it in a way where, yeah, you could kind of, there, there still could be kind of some glazing circuit through here. It might have to get reconfigured you know, 10, 20 years from now when we see that there's no demand for parking. So we just want to keep ourselves that flexibility. Great concept. And, and you know, with 15 feet of height, you get 30 feet of activation. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, that would be great. Do you have one contact for this one? One brand? Two brands. Two brands? Two brands. Yeah. Do you even have doggy parks on the inside and outside of the building? We, uh, so we are going to have. Do you have the restroom and maintain them as well? We are going to have. have and maintain yourself. Can I do a final comment? Yes. Um, yes. Are you doing any other testing mechanisms like a development agreement or anything like that or just the map? No, no, no. So one thing, as this board knows, we've been tracking is ability to um, monitor developments and then work with the council office on how we can and take any community benefits that come out of these projects and implement them in South Park. So with Team R here, the developer doesn't have much say in where that goes like they would with the development agreement, but this may be another opportunity to track a TPAR project that when funds land with the council office or the city, those funds can be directed towards uh, community improvement in South Park. All right, um, we're about to have another question. Yeah, so uh, this one is outside of the district, and as such, I want to give us some highlights. <laughs> 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 it's actually a black It does, it does, it does. It's very relevant. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm also excited to present our Main Street Tower project. As Ellen mentioned, this is just outside the eastern boundary, or the northeastern boundary of the bid. Uh, Sorry. That's not it. Oh, it's Okay, you should be able to control it now. So Main Street Tower, it is 363 units with 12,500 square feet of retail, 30-story tower. Again, just 
I think and no well. deviation from open trees or open trees or so as far as our con site context goes, the South Park really is off from where you see there's a lot of activity going on in this project. You have the get proper hotel is under construction, hospital hotel is under construction, Harold's Harold's Dam is under construction, Broadway House just finished here, Axel and my boat has finished here. Um, you have our own Main Street Park project that's proposed across the street, and other developments are being proposed in this particular area. It's going. Through the aerial view looking, that was an aerial view north of the project. Um, very similar kind of type of construction, type one tower force. So again, we challenge our, our design teams and different architectural designers to create, again, that texture and make it more dynamic facade. And as a result, you kind of see we have this movement of the solid panel that's very blazing and how that kind of works going up the tower. The basic configuration is you have retail and many space on the ground floor, three levels of above grade parking, again that top floor parking will be 15 foot floor to floor for future convertibility. The entire fifth floor is going to be indoor and outdoor amenity space, floor is 6 to 29 on residential units, and the third floor is another amenity deck. Um, jumping forward is a view looking north of the building. There. Uh, so going back to the, the tower and the screen, we're going to tower, we're going to bring the tower ground up all the way with blazing and spandrel planet panels here. We've been very aware of what's going on across the street. We decided architecturally to also have full screen here on this side of the tower as well as the north side of the tower, but that also allows to have some opening here and here to allow for natural ventilation. <laughs> This is a view looking south. One thing that we're doing is with our project across the street, we have a 4,000 square foot pocket park. We're going to propose a curb bump out. We want to match that across the street. So we're recessing the our retail a little bit here with a matching curb bump out. And we're going to have a visible crossing. And is this meant to be a parking component? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's This is the general site plan. We wrap the entire facade into a good retail and lobby and leasing office. We have access coming off Main Street and the alley to go up to the parking. Uh, the majority of our services are going to be had out. This is your typical parking floor plan. One thing I want to mention is our site is only about 125, 130 feet, which is not the standard city depth of 150 feet. That created a lot of issues with us design the parking structure. So as a result, we're unable to have the standard parking space. And one of our common requests is to have 100% compact spaces for the parking. So we are giving the quote amount, but we just couldn't fit the exact depth needed because of the um, untypical rate of quote. <laughs> So again, you see it's screen here, partial screening, full screening to ground the tower architecturally, and again, partial screening. Mm -hmm. This is a view from the alley. Mm -hmm. and then As you go into the inception. But again, we, we really get into the pedestrian experience is very important for us as much as we can. We have to enhance the streetscape, the water tree well, enhance paving, and enhance facilities. Did this project go along any other way? The same as this one. The entitlement pathway is a little bit easier instead of having to go to full commission. Um, it's for the director determination level approval. So um, this one could get approved quicker than the other one. That's 
system, things are going to come in block park, land block crossing, how to do block on top of park. Uh, this is your rubber top. <laughs> so, um, again, we need a map on this one, the subdivision. Um, the director determination for transfer to floor area, this is less than 50,000, which is why it has to go to full commission. Um, and then, as Daniel mentioned, the 100% of the stall is compact, but compact only is to depth. There's still going to be essentially as wide as standard spots, but it's just the circling around and then getting in is a difficult. And then site plan review. So, um, again, this is a, a quicker approach in a sense. And um, <coughs> then it lastly to the fashion district bid. Um, the the bonds have invested quite heavily in fashion district, so um, there's a lot of I think excitement around the various projects there. And then um, again, we got approval from the Lane's planning committee last week, and we'll um, go to the school board next month, and also have some kind of business. <laughs> okay, great. Let's take a couple of questions. Well, as you know, I think that's beautiful. We had some projects kind of trickling. Increase the uh, <coughs> level of activity of expenditure, which is great. Um, and as we discussed, very concerned about shadow and shading or the top pool with that property established. It is critical, so we'll follow up on that with you. Um, as well as the alleyway traffic issues, which I think we should investigate more thoroughly because I know that's. <coughs> Critical to not have too much congestion on a 14 foot wide alleyway, right at 11 between our two historic buildings. So, all of that said, I just wanted to put that out there that that is something that we are talking about with you all and appreciate the openness there. But I'm also, for this context, curious you don't, you have the room to stay, you know, at six to one if they are and get most of the units in there. Um, it's more expensive to build a tower. I think it's more attractive, but I'm just curious what you feel is the market kind of readiness to increase pricing there and do something that's quite out of character for what the neighborhood is today. So we're always looking at because we well, to take a step back, we are in the land speculators or non merchant builders or long term investors in the community in our hobby community as much as we can be. And so we are always looking at things how is this going to affect the neighborhood? 10, 20, 50 years from now, it's always our, <coughs> always our intent to enhance the neighborhood where we are investing it. And while we have a 85 story building across the street, we're proposing retail, but the market has turned in such a way, the downtown has turned in such a way to really command downtown high rise living. And we felt this was a good opportunity for us. So we're, we're scrapping a sustainable community environmental assessment. If you're unaware what that is, it's kind of like a super m &D. So we're in the process of the point. Uh, so yeah. We're Hi, um, again, my name is Michael Holt. My space actually is located in the industrial building that you'll put uh, South Park Towers on top of. Um, we're relatively new in terms of the total length of time that we've been here, but um, for the, over the last year we've had over 10,000 visitors come to our cultural programming and become a really important part of the neighborhood. So I was really interested, as you said at the end there, that you're interested in investing in the neighborhood in which you're putting your buildings. And so I'm just wondering if you're open to a conversation, not right now, but aside from here, where we can talk about the impact that these buildings could have on our space and on the community that we're building that is also an important part of this downtown area. I appreciate that. So it's a clear attractive project. I think it's very nice in our direction. But uh, along the same line that the question that Shannon asked, um, you cited almost the entire block from 11 to 12. What is the necessity to build a treasury story tower? You could pretty much, you know, I, I'm your neighbor just across the alley, and we have a community <coughs> hotel there as well. And, and also just going to be 
March lower than in Europe, obviously, so you're going to get affected by shape shadow. So if you own the entire block, why not make this a shorter um, tower and, and develop it across the entire site? That's a very good question. We kind of started with that process. That's how Onyx was built, Topaz was built, Emerald was really built that way. Project across the street and our Sapphire project were all built like that. We felt that as downtown is evolving, it gives us an opportunity to be a little bit more dynamic and aggressive in our approach. And uh, we always felt that there should be a balance between high rise and low rise buildings. You know, all high rise you know, have no view because you have a low rise you have no view. So given this opportunity to kind of balance and offset our towers to other things going on, we felt it was a good opportunity to really give our residents a unique view to the downtown. Uh, do I have time to one other to We got a new monitor, sorry, but you, I mean, we can maintain this monitor yeah, location cool. as always. So thank you, Daniel. Thank, thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, all right, I am happy to welcome our new downtown area captain, Jeff um, Nelson, to join us. To share a little bit about um, his role to the crime, crime trends Something that is that exceeds roughly about thousand dollars, but there's no 
enforcement period. And so that constitutes an arrest that can be taken. So that's about the But the numbers, we have eight this year. Last year, we only had one. So that's increased to 700%. Um, and you probably saw the video you know, we put out on social media. Um, you know, we were losing 10% trying to kind of drive here. We had 15 people, so a bunch of So those numbers are other thefts that we have, retail thefts, et cetera, 40 grade 26. <coughs> So, as far as violent crime, we look pretty good. It's about even, at least as compared to last year. We have a couple of robberies in the last couple of years. The other kinds of property crimes, that's where you're up to the first year. It doesn't go to the, the actual numbers. So, I'm sorry, I missed it. So, it's a clarifying question. 2017 versus 2018? 18? I'm sorry. 19, year to date, versus 18. Okay, so we still got our pace 18 based on your <coughs> and the and, and right, right, your down experience and your down experience. The most significant increase is for rate and rent. So can you talk a little bit about PD's approach to enforcement and deployment in our area? Well, I would say, yeah. Okay. So, um, about for, right? Everybody wants to go This is a conversation that Ellen and I have had, about how PC did, and historical, and fashion did. Everybody wants to go And I understand that because foot beats can and usually are effective as long as they're visible and it's not going. If I put two officers on foot beats, Seven from say May to today, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You're never going to know them there. They can just come and help. It's too much, right? So it has to be done in larger numbers. I'm restricted as far as how much I can get for footbeats because of just my personnel. <coughs> I do have a footbeat unit which is consists of two sergeants and 12 officers. Those 12 officers, they work in two man teams. Same thing as in the patrol side, the one who works in two teams. So we have six foot beats for downtown Los Angeles. And they cover the entire city. From the China Chapel, we cover the area. PC, South Park. So when they work, and they work the 410 schedule, they work seven days a week. So when they're working, if I'm the Chinatown car on my day to day to I would do the meet Chinatown. Um, and that goes for all the other days. So there's going to be three days a week where, generally speaking, you would not see your cooking because your cooking's on a day off. So we've kind of tweaked that model with this because of the activity that I've seen on month seven, the activity that I've seen in spring, uh, and to a lesser extent, uh, in north and south of seven. Specifically, kind of going north towards Fifth on um, Flower, Olive, and the streets up along Seventh. They don't want a higher presence of foot beats on that. So, we, we take a look at our crime numbers and we make a determination what is the best time for each day of the week to put a foot beat on Seventh. And we take a look at prior crimes. Right? Because I, what I don't want to do is um, that it will be at 7 from noon to 4 p.m. when crimes don't happen before they happen. <coughs> there's no, it doesn't make sense. So we're actually taking a look at when do the crimes occur predominantly, so when should you be there? And so we've identified those, and what I do is then take the entire unit that's working that day and put them all on 7. So I'm taking them from the other areas of the map, I put them all on 7 for a couple hours during that high time that we get. And then we'll also probably take them and put them on spring during those high times when they should be there. So that's maybe four hours a day that I'm taking the entire unit and I'm dedicating them to certain areas of the city, which is generally seven from spring. And then they go back to uh, the normal cooking areas where they're So I can't do it again, so I'll go to the cooking again, and then I'm putting them all in south. It's just you know, kind of spread out. 
So, do I want more for peace? Yes, I do. I would, I would love to have a, a unit of five soldiers and 50 officers that are dedicated to it. That would be a fantastic thing. I think that's the one on every street. Um, that would be highly effective. But that personnel meeting requirement is not there. Um, this has been brought up, and you know, everybody's aware, and I think they'll do what they can. Some, some days are considering right now hiring off duty LAPD to go off their in their area. So that, that's something that, that's, that's also been uh, thrown around. Uh, we did meet with the CCA yesterday. That's about an hour uh, uh, area city yesterday. Uh, and they're going to be trying to pursue a budget why not an increase. I, I don't know what they're doing with that, but we Some money can be dedicated to the old times of LED. Well, the there's a lot of different angles and things going on right now in this that are trying to increase the number of bookings that we have downtown. Um, because they're needed. They're effective. So, it's sort of that those are in the works. It's not, you know, on the media investment, probably the next fiscal cycle, which will come around pretty quick, actually, July 1. So. Uh, those are the reasons. In addition to just quick beats and kind of how we're using it differently, um, we have a mounted unit. Generally speaking, in the past, we put the, the mounted unit, which is Metro, we have about 10 officers on horses. We've been putting them into Skid Row. And they've been working Skid Row pretty much consistently for the past couple of years. Um, there's been a lot of violent crime. But now we're seeing pretty much a 50 50 mix with the in-skid room and the fixed room. So, and today, mounted, it's going to be on the 7th, and they're going to be on the spring. And it probably will be on the 10th, right? It's about the 15th, and the Marines were here. So I'm taking them out of the skid row and putting them out in the areas of downtown where the number of battalions that are doing them to be. So it's extremely. Plain clothes and plain cars, 
run in these high crime areas, um, see what they can sort of, they, they can sort of take action against other late runners about rain jackets and things like that. And we'll have other layoff cars that can come in if needed. <coughs> That's a different strategy that we're going to be taking hopefully in the next month or so once they get the campaign. I've also got our vice unit yesterday was out there. The vice, you don't know the cops, right? They're uh, plain clothes, bearded up, describing. Uh, but they're very respected. They have now been working with the seventh core here and spring school door, playing clothes while we're cooking and looking for intel, seeing people hanging out, looking for deals, things like that, and then we'll follow the unit and then make big stops. Um, they will also issue citations to the public and those kind of uh, infraction related crimes will stop them up there, they'll sign them up, which is a way for us because we don't know that the ticket is probably not going to be paid. It'll eventually turn to warrant, and now we've got this individual with the warrant, and we'll pay for that warrant. So there's a lot of different things that are going on, a lot of different resources in the area. So, yeah, I just want to add um, we are still working with Jonah today, but she's fantastic. Um, and I think Sylvia Pia, I'm sure she's being kind of. <coughs> And she and our team, and me directly, are in communication multiple times a week. Uh, we also have kind of focusing on what is dedicated to South Park. Um, our show is here, and we have the entertainment detail that services um, the LA Live and Convention Center campus, um, and we're in communication with those folks too uh, on a you know, very regular basis. Um, I do want to open it up to questions. I know that there were some that were directed at Vita before. Yeah, um, thank you for coming, and thank you for your good work. Um, I have a couple of questions, I'll try to be quick, but um, the question I asked earlier was that I personally talk to cops all the time, not just here, but everywhere in downtown, and all of them pretty much tell me that we're not allowed to enforce the law with homeless people. They, one guy told me that right next to Prank, he literally told me that if a homeless guy shits on that window there, I really can't do much about it. And the reason is he's homeless. And then he said, if you did it, you'd be arrested. So there is a protected, quote unquote, class, which is homeless who can do things the rest of us can't do. That's one issue. Uh, another one is I volunteer at the homeless mission, the, the, um, the midnight uh, mission in, in Skid Row. And I'm doing it for two reasons, because I want to try to do something myself. Uh, me and my company, but I also want to find out what's actually going on. Um, because it seems to me that if you, <coughs> if you allow anyone to live on the streets, you're going to have a condition where the police is going to be primarily occupied with chasing that crime that follows that. Um, and if you have people who live in the streets, you're going to have more people who live in the streets. Because some people are mentally ill, some people are just anarchists who don't want to follow rules. So they go do that, and then you, it just keeps piling on. And what I'm seeing is you guys are completely overwhelmed with that issue. And it just adds on and adds on and on. I have been to City Hall a few times, and I get blank stares from them when you confront them. And like, what are you guys doing? Um, so lastly, I came to downtown Los Angeles in 2004 when all of this started happening. And I was like, I came from Manhattan before, and I was like, wow, we're going to have a Manhattan in, in LA, and we have better weather than in Manhattan does, so this is going to be amazing. But then, and I used to avoid downtown because of homeless people, but then I saw some, like, it started changing, and then now it's been getting worse again. And so, William Bratton was the police chief in New York when I was there. He was hired by Jim Hahn, and I read a lot of articles about he was specifically trying to do the same things they did in New York, which was to arrest homeless people if they consistently set up tents and living quarters on the streets, which is illegal to begin with. But then what I heard was that there was a settlement by the city of Los Angeles, a homeless person sued, um, brought by the ACLU who said, you cannot arrest somebody and put them in jail if they don't have a home to go to. And then the city apparently settled that lawsuit. I, I, this is what I heard. What I'm saying is if you do that, well, of course you're going to have what we have, and you guys can be completely unable and not able to do anything about it because they're allowed to be there, and that was in scared row. But what I'm seeing is it's spreading, 
not just Skid Row, but then Skid Row is becoming the rest of downtown. And now, seriously, the city is considering settling a second lawsuit to actually allow the rest of downtown to become Skid Row. I'm, I'm just amazed that people can even consider settling something like that. Now, I, I realize I'm sitting here talking to you, but what I want to know is, are you guys handcuffed? Or can you enforce existing law that you cannot live, do drugs, or do things on the streets that the rest of us can't do? Because I'm not able to get any clear answer. I get it from street cops who tell me confidentially that it's a political problem. They're really not willing to do anything at City Hall, and it just keeps blowing up and up and up and up. But then when I talk to people, like in these kinds of meetings, I'm not getting any sort of strict talk. You said a lot. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to disagree with anything that you're saying. Okay? Um, the homeless issue is just that. It's a very significant issue that we have. Do the police have some sort of authority to deal with that issue? Yes and no. Right? Yes, we have some laws and books that we can enforce, and we do. Right. Um, but, for example, if I come up with someone who has a pen for right? it's a seven eight, so we need to take a pen now. So what they'll do is a drop the pen, right? There's still 36 inches of passage on the sidewalk, and you have to go through. And they will be fine. How can I enforce that? Well, if I come up to you and that pen is completely blocked from the sidewalk, there is no ADA clearance. I say, please take down your tent. I can give you a reasonable amount of time to do that. If you refuse, now I can enforce the section. Here's the caveat for that. If I'm taking a two-man car to deal with that one tent, and he refuses, so now I'm going to effect an arrest, I take him and all of that property. And now that two-man car is gone for hours and hours and hours dealing with that one situation, right? So if we did that every day, we'd have no cops in the street. My seven cars would go out there, they'd get a violation, their first five minutes, and they're gone. You have nobody who's on the that. So it's not an effective use of our resources to enforce those sections. Um, generally speaking, though, we get compliance with that, right? generally do. Um, these people that are living on the street understand, for the most part, um, when we ask them to take it down, they'll take it down. If they don't have the basic inches, they'll roll it up and provide 36 inches or move it to provide that clearance. That's generally what we get. But you still see the tent, so in your mind, it's still not sure nothing's being done, but they're complying with what they need to supply. Okay? As far as the other issues and the expanse of the homelessness in downtown, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to give my opinion or anything like that, okay? Um, but it is an issue, it's a problem, it's growing. Um, there are things in the works being dealt with uh, to address these situations. I think it's just gonna take a little bit of time for these things to actually come into fruition. The additional housing that's being built. So I just had a meeting a couple of days ago with the Skid Row Housing Trust. We built four new uh, buildings on seven and wall. It's gonna house an additional <coughs> 500 people, uh, and there's another one that's being built for the next year. And if you want to send it here, I believe it's going to house another 100. So there's a lot of things in the works and plans to offer housing and get people off the street, but it's just, it's taking time. What's your current view? Uh, change to New York. I always hear that about New York. New York is, they mm -hmm. change their whole state structure so they are a right to shelter state. So everybody there has their right to have shelter. In Fancy apartments, not so fancy apartments. I think if you ask the people where they put those apartments, they would have different opinions about the way the state approached that. We got sued under Jones and settled. That settlement applies to the entire state. So at night, people can have their tents up because we have not built enough shelter. Is that a it's, private issue to shelter, or is it a government issue? Everyone can open a shelter. Private companies can open a shelter. The government can open the shelter. We have 9,800 shelter beds for about 30,000. Because the Midnight Nation told me that they're having difficulty building more. Yeah, so I, I do want to, there's one question in the back, and before we get there, I want to just say that the bid is 
very much interested in this issue. This is the number one issue that I think everybody in the city should be thinking about and figuring out what our role is. So if you are uh, interested and concerned yeah. and this goes for everybody, please do engage with us. Um, we have a lot of information to share and that's sort of what our role is, is being the convener of this information and getting it out. Um, we're in the process now of working with the mayor's office to put together a, um, you know, a cheat sheet, essentially, of who is doing what in the city, because it is incredibly complicated, right? There's the role of the PD, there's the role of the city attorney, there's everybody else's role, and so we're trying to kind of consolidate that so that it's more clear for our stakeholders. I do see one question in the back. Um, yeah, so first of all, I just want to say shame on you and your lack of intolerance and your lack of showing actually incarceration of some house people has gone up in the last few years. But I also just wanted to know if you know, sir, um, how many unhoused people died or were killed in the South Park district uh, in the last year. Deaths of people yeah. living on the street. We do have people dying from exposure on the street, yes. Um, that's so not true. Do I know exactly how many in South Park area? No. Um, most of our deaths that we get are natural deaths on the street are occurring uh, in the city row area in the community. Um, don't, we do have some outside skid row, but not nearly what we experience inside skid Okay, and Tom? Um, I, I would just say that uh, <clears throat> the South Park today will be meeting three weeks ago, maybe, of neighbors about <coughs> this issue, and there's there was an incredible amount of people willing to work and offer resources to at least address what's going on in South Park. And I would just offer that up as a statement that we're trying to do something. And I think there's more out there that can kind of come together. I want to clarify one thing. I want to clarify one thing into the question. I had in your answer, and maybe this wasn't clarified quite clearly, at least for me, intentionally, but this is what I wanted to clarify. If, well, number one, two things. Number one, they usually move. The tents is what I'm referring to. If they don't move, the, the, the cops, the, the officers, they're moving on. Okay? And that's why we see tents on the street, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's an allocation issue. They're in violation, but you're not going to take two guys off the street to deal with this violation, so therefore the violation stands. Is that, that's what I've heard. At times? Okay. Can I, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Okay. It's, it's, it's important to know that the way the ordinance is written, it's not against the law to have your tent back. The sorry. way it's written is if they have to go and ask and have them take the tent down, right. and if they refuse, then they can issue them. Almost everyone that they've ever been to, like, always take it down. We've had right. 100 cases in the entire city of people refusing. Right, yes. right. And so it's it's the exception, but let's say, and, and the violation I'm referring to is, is there's no covenants <coughs> for, for people to pass. For, you know, the 36 inches you're saying, therefore there would be a violation, but you're not doing anything because that would be taking. Well, also, you gotta consider this, right? At any given time, uh, I would say right now with day watch, I have you know, six eight cars, two S cars, so I've got sixteen officers on front, eight cars. Right. So everything that you see, they may not see it. They're busy running around hanging their eight cars going here, here, there, 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 there. And that tent that's blocked the sidewalk and stuff all day long, we may never see it. Because we just okay. don't go down that street, we just don't see it. Um, so there's that component too. We don't see okay. everything in the city every day all the time. Yeah, I'm not trying to, I mean, again, great job. I'm not trying to find blame. I'm just trying to understand. Okay, got okay. it. Okay. Um, we have to move on, and, I, and I'm sorry, but um, again, the same thing goes that this is an open communication here. So for the folks that you want to stay invested in this issue, um, I really welcome you to do that, and we will continue the conversation with the PD and the city attorney. Everybody else that's, uh, that's concerned about this issue. So thank you for yeah, that being here. Um, we do have one final presentation. Um, and it's another exciting project in the district. And then we've got some business that we need to cover. And I'm going to do my best to keep us uh, as much as I can at this point. So uh, without time to welcome up our presenters here. Okay, so we're going to our party.
project and I'm one of the member of a, a team on the Towers and we acknowledge a few other people. Um, uh, we have Nabi Yosef, the architectural engineer, and so this is handling the civil engineering and survey and construction of the uh, uh, So there's a, sort of a lot of uh, on the project. Uh, I know everyone is eager to see the project, so I just want to give you a very brief overview uh, before handing it to our architect to walk you through it. Um, the project is located at the northwest corner of Olympic and Figueroa, where wash currently. Uh, the, the tower is 57 stories and it consists of 374 condominiums, a hotel with 373 rooms, approximately 100,000 square feet of commercial space that would include hotel amenities, restaurants, retail, and some office. <laughs> the total project square footage is about 781,000 square feet. The FAR 13 to 1. Site and zone C2 or D, so wherever the elements go, we're requesting site plan review, uh, master conditional use permit for alcohol and entertainment associated with the hotel. A zone variance to allow outdoor dining above the ground floor, a zone variance to provide uh, less than one on site tree for four units and take an off site too. Um, zone variants to provide short term inside a building and short term and long term bicycle parking on a level other than the ground floor. Uh, a vesting track map and the direct determination for transfer of floor area of more than 50,000 square feet. That's the so far part. Okay, so it's my honor to introduce my friend Roberto Nardi, and also with him today is Yuku Pan, another architect from, from Nardi Associates. Um, if Roberto's name is not familiar to you, it's because he's been busy designing public and private projects all over the world, including China and Mexico and Argentina and Puerto Rico and many places I've never been that sound very exotic, uh, as well as doing other major projects domestically in places like New Orleans and San Francisco. So Roberto really brings an international perspective to downtown LA, and I could go on about him, so I will stop there and hand it over to him to walk you through the project. You know, when I was attending the Jay presentation today, I was going to make a point of remark. I think I like think you got a, you know, <laughs> attending the different concerts and, and the tour. So we are today, after many years, that we had a presentation with the same organization when we started the project. And like Lady Gaga, I like, ended up in two, so this is another condition. <laughs> Unfortunately, I never got an Oscar. I hope that we can meet you one today. But uh, <laughs> this project, when I started working in this project, you know, we, we've been doing projects everywhere in, in different cities in China and Europe. And I go to downtown, I was really listening to their conversations about the gentleman, talking about the challenges of downtown. LA, you know, growing up, suffering the growing pains confronting so many challenges. So there we have this incredible site, location-wise. Uh, my friend Anne said that it's like a, putting a stand on the edge of an envelope because, you know, we are in such a tiny site, complicated, so well located, that when I approach the project, and I need to say that before showing the project, it was to find a strategy how to design this site. So the strategy was instead of creating a self-contained structure, think that we are at the heart of the entertainment industry. We are in a very disappeared of the city, the location of the site. So how we can create a building that instead of being an encapsulated glass tower that contain the people, we can see that this building becomes interactive and synergy with the people. So the whole design, as you can see, is extremely permeable. It is, you see through the building, and the building to see from the building to the sea. So the sea and the building supposedly will be in a sort of a dialogue that the architecture is intended to feel. I 
Pentacle and Anne, sorry, mentioned that would be working outside. We just came back from Vegas and we were familiar with the Vegas scenario, which is probably one of the most prestigious exhibit by the way. Because the firm was invited to present their project actually at the Vegas scenario. And they asked me, and this is the final remark before we show the project, they asked me to identify a model, a theme that identified our presentation. And I said, I don't know what theme, what can I do? So I I started looking to my history of design. I didn't realize that was a sort of a stretch in the process. All my buildings for 40 something years of practice in several places always have been trying to relate, create <coughs> transition spaces in between buildings, cities, and intermediate spaces. So I came with a concept to call my exhibit in Venice. Uh, framing the air. See, see, framing the air. Wow. Yeah, because in reality, we are we are appropriating the thing which is more important than that, than the air. So we, the baby that you will see now, is intending to connect with that concept. So we just going to do the first thing is a small video <clears throat> that unfortunately we have the same problem that before. It's only you know. I know, but I mean the same problem that is interrupted. Yes, yeah, yeah. uh, we downloaded it onto okay. Anyway, uh, because the site is very tough, super tough, we decided that the only way to create a profit efficient building, not only that would be better than pleasant, was to eliminate entirely the interior structure. So the building, as you can see, is framed from the outside, is supported from the outside, creating these penetrable spaces that you can see when they're along the sidewalk. And uh, after that, I graduated from Columbia University. My third job was with a guy which is very well known down the country, two years old. I am Pei, Pei you mean. And when I went with Pei, I remember he said one day, talking to the office, never design a wedding cake only for your real wedding. So he was calling the wedding cake was the disconnection of buildings with the sidewalk for the pedestrian. You know, the way you came that you have one day on top of another one, on top of another one. So this building is essentially a challenge to the concept of the way you came. <laughs> and you can see we bring the building, or we grow the building on the sidewalk, creating intermediate spaces for the people who will be walking on the sidewalk of the On the, which is also pretty interesting about the you can see this is the corner of Olympic and Figueroa, and again the structure. We're going to have some images of the innovation section. Can you probably, I think this is not your thing, either you will be able to go to the other room here. Um, the yeah, then you can see what right other You can see the way it works. You see the view from Olympic, and um, the structure is the architecture. The, is is veneer with uh, we are using a special kind of glass which is produced by a European firm called Sage. That by the way, you read in 71 and above the restaurant here in downtown, they have that glass which is you can operate it directly on an app from your phone, eliminating curtains, and you can create different colors and different levels of translucency and transparency. So this building would be like a kaleidoscope, you know, using, transforming and eliminating absolutely all the interior curtains, which is a great saving by the way we're doing, with a 5% increase of the glass cost. So this is it. The architecture is the glass with different colors, plus the architecture produced by the exoskeleton structure. Uh, 
Yeah, we're getting the presentation <laughs> So, maybe I forgot to mention something very important in this project, part of the challenges. In the proximity to the Figueroa Hotel, when we realized that we have an important historic building, but a long connection with downtown, and what would have been imposed in this big top guy, this Magic Johnson version of a building next to the 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 Olympic there at the Figueroa Hotel, we we did work with the historic district, try to connect certain elements of our design to the proportion and the scale of the Figueroa Hotel. And by doing that, as you can see here, we move, this is the Figueroa Hotel, we steer the building <coughs> really to allow the hotel to breathe, particularly the area where the pools are. So we sat down with the hotel owner, we described our project, but we are trying to be really understanding the significance of that connection. Um, so this is the ground floor plan, <coughs> very simple. We have, this is Olympic, this is Figueroa. You can see the configuration of the building. And along the sidewalk, which is this one, we are creating this intermediate space that I was talking about, established by the uh, downtown design guidelines where the building is growing and creating that kind of a colonnade. It's not a colonnade, but it's molded. <coughs> the intention is like a <coughs> transition of spaces that you see in some European city. And this one. This is a typical floor plan. Probably, when I was talking about the cultural framing here, this is the main lobby of the hotel located in the 14th floor. It's a big carving of the building. This is what I would call the window to the city. And maybe you can, uh, this is a typical floor plan, keep going, if you think of that. This is the top of the building. The building has four fundamental entertainment spaces. The rooftop, benefited by the elimination of the heavy pads today. The second one is in the 17th floor, which is part of this huge that I showed before, lobby of the hotel. And then the area dedicated for the condominiums next to the Figueroa Hotel, which is a kind of a, and we have a, a, a little place allocated for dogs too, so the doggy park, but for the private residence. The next one. Please. Then you can see <coughs> the building from its own dimensions. And you, you understand that when I was talking about these supports. Uh, excuse me. One of the important things is this huge 17 story high atrium. That's carving the building. That's why we have the, <coughs> all the vegetation growing. We're going to have vines. It's intended to be uh, quite friendly. It's almost like an urban tree. That's the intention of the building. And because we've been working already with three years with the local you know, consultants, it would be pretty comfortable that we move even further than the typical internal process, this process already is a pretty much developed in, in, in the human design phase. Uh, by the way, Dan can comment where we are with the company. This is the view, this is the view of hotel. This is the view of hotel, sorry. This is the transitional space in between the building and the view of hotel. You see the same height of the view of hotel, which makes that portion of the building a little less menacing, you know, threatening to the presence of the hotel. Next one, please. Does it move? You see, yeah. you're honoring your elevation. <laughs> uh, you can see right there some of the images of the people walking. This is the access to the hotel. We enter, we have a sort of a turnaround access from the alley. That is connected as well to the side entrance of the Hero Hotel. This is Olympic. And you can see the big uh, structure coming down to the edge of the And this is a very important view. So that's what I would say. You see, this is the Figueroa Hotel. This is our building. 
as you can see, we create a transition of the site. Even our architecture doesn't necessarily, even though we have zero setback, we could, we could bring our building against the figure of hotel, but I think there was a kind of architectural crime. So we create this. Now we have a police officer here. So, uh, perfect. So that gap in between the hotel and our building allows the building, both buildings, to breathe, which is what you are seeing right there. Go ahead. No? That's it. Nothing happened. It's taking. It's a public document. You can ask it to the EIR, who has been already published. Well, so, I, I think you're pulling drive there on the one thing. It could be problematic for you during certain times of the day. I well, saw. they they did in several instances a big hours, which mm -hmm. is what they are talking about. And they are very reputable people working in downtown for years, so we feel it would be necessary probably to start a traffic light uh, a little further down from the corner of the political figure of uh, which is right in front of the access to LA Light. Oh, well, that's my point. Yeah, because right there is what it could be the point where we need to regulate the traffic. So they counted. Uh, and, you know, even they measure the traffic during the university operation time, because that was a major significant impact occurring in the cities of the you the traffic of the area. So we, we feel comfortable, and actually the city and the DOT feel comfortable, which is for us, is what we are needing to be, <laughs> to be on my back. I'm cool. <laughs> All right, um, this one has a timeline. Okay, yes, so I'll say from your question to yours is perfect. So um, we got the application <coughs> December 15th, I think, uh, 2015. So right. three, <laughs> my baby's three, our baby's three years <laughs> <laughs> um, So part of I am not the father. <laughs> 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 you have to, excuse me. I'm not the father. So, okay, I did that. So, <laughs> we saw in December 2015, and so we've been doing the AR. So there's nothing that's not being studied. Assure you, we've been studying. We are studying everything, and part of the reason it's taken uh, so long is because there was so much, uh, so many projects filed in the last couple of years in downtown. Sure, right. So the city had a related projects list that kept changing. It kept changing. So it probably took us an extra year because things kept changing. So um, that's so we filed it about three years ago. Now we published the draft EIR October fourth, which was last year. Where uh, public comment period is closed. We're responding to. Comments. All the comments, which were not super substantial and were more than expected. I mean, it was for a, bit, for a 57 story tower in the middle of downtown, it was not much. I'm sorry, how many people were going to that? I don't know, maybe like 10 or something. I mean, really not very. I don't want to be too specific because I'm sure it's a very but nothing. 
something we didn't expect. Um, uh, so we're heading to public hearings soon, which is why we're here. So now we're kind of trying to engage on the public because we're heading to the city planning commission maybe April, although I'm not sure that's what it's But um, <laughs> so I, I expect the date of completion is what I, I mean, well, do you have, you know, if you think that you even come, you know, we do several calendars throughout the streets, uh, are, are really issue of the time that we expect that we say mid of the year can happen. Even the yeah. public hearings is supposed to be incurred in April. We assume that the current <coughs> development that we need to go with the working draft is going to be We take that idea. So that will take us to the beginning of 2020, mid-2020. Mm -hmm. And two years so I would say 2022, probably the present. Thank you, please. Thank you all so much for being here. I do apologize, I know I said we would be earlier. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, um, we do have a number of different uh, items to, to address, um, and I want to make it happen. So, um, I'm going to give for, for board members who have a chance to do finances. So they're doing that now through their um, district office. Um, and there are also, there's also going to be a larger downtown transportation needs assessment um, that you know, will be doing. That hasn't really started yet. They're going to be doing a big public outreach. Um, but that's really to kind of identify you know, for long term like what are our transportation needs downtown and looking for funding um, sources. And so those. Um, our priority list that, that working group um, and infrastructure planning develop is given to them um, and we'll be working with them to try to get that um, through. Um, along with that, uh, we're also part of a working group uh, working on Pico Station. As you know, we've been working on trying to create, separate that. Metro is um, hopefully coming to their board. Metro staff is coming to their board, hopefully in the April um, board meeting. Um, they'll be coming with a bunch of different options um, that they've started to study. Uh, so just keep your eye out for that, um, and you know, we'll be involved um, to public engagement then. Final thing, we're also, um, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, oh, the dogs, okay. So uh, the, the last couple of meetings, um, in infrastructure and planning meeting, we've been putting together this best practices guideline uh, for streetscape um, landscaping particularly in relation to uh, dogs. As everybody knows, we have lots of dogs in the district, which is great. We want it to be a um, attractive place for people to have dogs and for the owners. But we're trying to sort of balance the needs of having dogs, but also having nice landscaping and mitigating the smell and mess and all that. 
So we've uh, met with a number of different property owners, um, landscape architects, Mia Lair has been very helpful. Um, just trying to come up with best practices for what types of plants um, we plant along the street and tree wells and parkways. Um, what sort of maintenance, um, creating dog waste areas and what kind of materials and all that. Um, we've gone through um, a couple drafts of that or almost have it finished. I'm just waiting on some exhibit from Mia Lair. Um, it's just guidelines, so there's nothing required, but it's something we can hand to developers or property owners and say, you know, this is the research what we've done, this would, is what we would recommend in terms of um, you know, maintenance and planting and all that. So that should be coming out in the next couple weeks and we'll distribute that out to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna be really quick. Um, if you walked here, you saw that our wayfinding boxes were finally installed. They look amazing. We're so happy with how they turned out. Um, thank you to all of our sponsors, Barcito, Be Organic Dry Cleaners, California Hospital, the Grammy Museum, J Enterprises, LA Live, Los Angeles Convention Center, Mac Real Estate, The Proper Hotel, and the YWC of Greater Los Angeles. We could not have done it without you. Um, Rios Clemente Hale Studios was our designer. They did an amazing job. Colin is here from CRNA, who was our printer. Um, and Council District 14 um, in kind of graffiti coding for us. So we could not have pulled this off without all of the above. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give you a really quick preview of why you should come for a district identity and marketing committee meeting on the 13th of March. Um, we are focusing this year, among other things, on really doing a better job of surfacing the work that the bank does. And so uh, that's taking a few forms right now. We've started to invest in high quality photography. We had a photographer out here last week um, who shared about 400 shots with me, um, which we're gonna use in a website overhaul to better surface the work that we do um, with the goals of making it easier for the user and easier for staff to keep updated and relevant. Um, and we're working on a temporary alley activation. We've identified a short list of four alleys that could use a little bit of help. Um, and we're gonna see what we can do with some paint and some very low budget uh, quick um, upgrades. So thanks, and I hope to see you on the 13th. Awesome, thanks for all the support. Um, all right, I wanna give a, an update to the board on our office relocation. Um, obviously, we're here. <laughs> so that feels really good. Um, right, Tess. No, uh, we came in, our budget, final budget was $260,000. We had three change orders, which it didn't account for, and we are over. Um, we are over by 10,000. We have our reserves, and we are using that. Um, it was a long process. It, it, I have to say thank you to Daniel specifically. Um, I honestly could not have done this whole thing without you, so thank you very much for your credit. Um, we're still obviously working through a couple of kinks, the internet being one of them, but that is. Um, that is being resolved I think, in the next like, week. In the next week, yes. yeah. So after that, we're smooth sailing. If you haven't checked out our operation space in the back, you, you definitely should. It's beautiful, and um, our guys are doing a really great job. And that brings me to um, the next item on the agenda, which is a clean and safe program update. I did have a deck, but I think I'm just going to run through it. So uh, as you all know, we switched vendors at the beginning of this year. So now we are um, both clean and safe services are being offered by block by block. And actually, we've got two block by block folks here with us, so if you have questions specifically for them, um, that's Daniela and Derek, and that's me in the back. Um, we, both of our program managers, Jamal and Victor, have flown to Louisville, Kentucky for some pretty intensive training, week-long training. Um, we have really cool and fun new equipment. We have a pressure washer bicycle, tricycle. We have, um, Four ATLDs, which are essentially gigantic vacuum cleaners, and allows us to do our um, uh, you know district-wide cleaning of sidewalks and curb lines um, much more efficiently than we were in the past. Um, we in the deck, which I will show you all, uh, I outlined the, the, the metrics that we're capturing, and we'll be tracking those very closely so we can see the month over month how that's going. Um, but overall, I would say we are incredibly pleased with. Our operations and with this decision to kind of go uh, to join these two operations in one group. So thank you very much to Block the Block and to Victor and Jamal for doing a fantastic job. All right, um, we are headed into closed sessions. There, I'm, I'm listing off to you'll see that item number 13 is all of the upcoming events. Please do mark your calendars. One thing I do want to do a quick shout out to is the California um, 
hospital, part of the city bank is an annual race, and it's happening at the end of the next month on the 30th. Um, mark your calendars and tell me about that. I'm sorry? Yes, we are. We've got a team. So our staff is running, a few of our operations uh, team members are running, if we're walking or whatever. If anybody wants to join our team, let us know. We would love to um, out represent other team members in our center. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, with that, we're going to head into closed session. Um, audience members, I, I'm, I am a little concerned, frankly, about the soundproofness of my office. And so I ask audience members, uh, non board members, to uh, please leave the building if you <laughs> would like to know. Um, you know, I will come out and announce what the, you know, if there are results to announce from the closed session, I will do that. Um, I can't give an accurate estimate of time, but if you want to come out, um, 